Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Invest Africa. I'm Alicia Sekam. Well, while Africa is hailed as the world's new investment frontier and the continent has shown sterling economic performance, Africa's agricultural sector lacks luster. Unless Africa gets to grip with its Achilles heel and rises to the challenge, the breakthrough anticipated by investors and governments may not come to fruition. Between 2010 and 2025, 16 of the top 20 fastest growing cities in the world will be in Africa, and the population of five of the fastest growing cities will double, coupled with a tripling of the middle class and productivity that is predicted to grow by 3% annually. These statistics paint a promising story. However, the food-related statistics tell a mixed story. African women grow 80 to 90% of the food in sub-Saharan Africa, but own less than 2% of all land. 3.5 million more tractors are needed to put Africa on par with other regions, and 79% of Africa's arable land remains uncultivated. This according to the Ibrahim Foundation study conducted in November last year. Food production has not kept up to the explosion of Africa's population, and as a result, the value of annual food imports is expected to rise to a costly 11 billion US dollars by 2020. However, in 2003, African heads of state and their governments showed an appetite for serious investment in agriculture. They agreed to the signing of the Maputo Declaration on Agriculture and Food Security, meaning that countries have committed to increasing their agricultural budget to at least 10% of their national budget within five years. Since the signing of the declaration, there has been a notable shift in a handful of African countries. Countries such as Rwanda, Malawi, Mali and Kenya have all secured agriculture investments way beyond the targeted 10%. Because of these new capital injections, modern agriculture equipment has been imported and farmers have been offered incentives to increase productivity. Well, joining me in studio now to take a closer look at the agricultural investment opportunity space and challenges in Africa is Antoni Dalport. He's South Africa country head at Syngenta, Hans Balia Mujura, who is general manager, uh, Agri Business Frontline and Africa at ABSA, and John Purchase, CEO of AgBiz. They all join us uh, in studio while joining us from our bureau in Nairobi is Hugh Scott, director at the Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund. Welcome, gentlemen and let's get straight into conversation here I mean uh, John I just uh, came through a study this morning that uh, reflected wheat production in sub-saharan Africa is at only 10 to 25 percent of its potential that potential sitting with a net return possibility of two hundred dollars per hectare I mean why is it such a challenge broadly speaking developing the agri space on the continent Sure, there are a couple of reasons. I think the, pri the primary reason is, is around policy issues um, uh, that we still find and forms of government that we still find problems in Africa. Uh, there is development in some countries uh, granted and the insert also showed that the investment in agriculture from certain governments is improving mm -hmm. but it's certainly not at the, at the level that it should be so there are a couple of factors that we have to look at infrastructure is obviously a, another major issue which uh, makes the cost of doing business very expensive so we've got to be competitive uh, mm -hmm. and we've got to create uh, policies that make us competitive in the global market we're in the global food jungle and we've got to compete in that jungle and uh, We've got to change our thinking about competitive agriculture. Let's perhaps, Antony, uh, focus on the regulatory environment that investors have to operate in within the agri space. I mean, commentary has been that Africa's business environment is improving, that governance on the continent is getting better. I mean, from your experience in the agricultural space, is it getting easier to do business within this sector of the African economy? I think it's a very relevant question, Alicia. We can see in the last couple of years and months a strong political will to put policy in place to enable this agricultural growth we currently uh, are all aware of. It is actually very important that there should be a very strong and robust regulatory framework in place mm -hmm. in order to, to stimulate this potential growth in Africa, but definitely yes. Governments, and a good example is probably what we see in Tanzania, 
in terms of government's involvement in making this happen. Yeah, it's risky business though by nature and that's where a player uh, like Syngenta and its role in developing this space actually stands out. So take us through, uh, you know, as a mechanism what we're looking at from Syngenta's side looking to alleviate some of the challenges and the risks that are inherent to business operating here. Sure. Uh, in terms of the risk, there are obviously uh, political risks and in some cases instability. But that's something you encounter wherever we operate as Syngenta. So it's something that we wouldn't have even considered in terms of making this investment to this size of $500 million if we haven't considered all the factors. So we believe and we're very confident that we can be successful in managing these risks if we align the right partners and making sure we involve governments at all level mm -hmm. in order to, to enable their function in terms of alleviating some of these pressures and be part of this growth initiative in Africa. Hence, uh, not so long ago, we had a drive by the former Soviet Republic of Georgia luring farmers its way to rebuild the sector on that end. And we had quite a few South African uh, farmers being enticed and lack of government support in South Africa in particular was cited as one of the major reasons for their exit. Are we seeing uh, enough stride from a government's perspective in terms of helping and sustaining this industry moving forward uh, from a financier's perspective? Well, I think from anyone's perspective, we'd want to see a lot more government involvement or support from a policy perspective. And you would also say that I think it's one of looking at ensuring that the policy environment cr makes it competitive enough for the farmers remain engaged in, in commercial production or commercial agriculture. I think the challenges faced by South Africa are a bit also unique compared to the rest of, of Africa. Mm -hmm. In that one, South Africa has got to handle or address land reform and complete that. And while you might see that some commercial farmers were attracted out of South Africa, you would actually say, I wouldn't say that they are leaving South Africa. Some are divesting in terms of having diversifying their risks to ensure that they're exposed to other risks, not only South African risks, and knowing that they cannot expand as they would want to expand in South Africa. But it's also, the expansion is mainly driven by the cost of production. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can drop your costs is really to manage your fixed costs. And that's why you find farmers expanding. And it's one of the challenges that you face within Africa in that while you have the majority of farmers being small scale farmers, they face exactly the same type of costs. And that is one of the big challenges on making agriculture profitable. How do you make it profitable bearing in mind that you have the majority of your farmers are small scale farmers. We'll be touching on infrastructural capacity and technology, you know, in aiding that, that part. Before we do though, let's take it to uh, Nairobi where Hugh joins us. Uh, Hugh, how do you rate the willingness of government out there to work with investors to develop the sector of the economy? And perhaps an indicator of that would be the regulatory environment from your experience over in Kenya. You know, agriculture is very much at the top of, of the priority list for many, many um, African countries. We at the Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund, um, which is uh, sort of, it's about a $200 million fund that invests in agribusiness in, 20, in over 20 countries in Africa uh, at the moment. Uh, we recognize in many of the countries in which we work in that the, the regulatory environment for agriculture is improving. Um, but one of the key issues behind that is, one of the issues is is it's not really what the facts of the matter are, it's what the perceptions the private sector has. And still Africa has much to do to change the attitude that people have about Africa. Actually, it's a much better place to do business in than most people believe. But actually, um, fortunately, investors act on perception rather than, than facts. So there's a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. But the real issue, I believe, is, is basically about making agricultural markets work and I think we would all agree that that's a combination of the legal and regulatory environment being positive, um, the necessary infrastructure, the necessary financing mechanisms in place. It's not just one element that's going to make the difference. It's about getting that package of, of activities and support mechanisms in place that can make those market, those agricultural markets work a lot better. So let's drill down into some of those support factors for this industry. Hence, I mean, you need access to capital, as uh, Hugh highlighted, you need financing mechanisms as well. How easy is it to secure financing for agricultural projects on the continent? Because from the research I've been doing, one gets a sense that, you know, the financial sector in Africa still operates on quite a conservative basis. Yes, you'd say, and, and like, he has touched on it's, it's a number of aspects. The, the environment in which you operate has a contribution. 
because the key issue is going to be what, what kind of policy or markets do we have? What is, what's the access to the market like? And therefore, do we have certainty in terms of getting the produce mm -hmm. to the market? And once we get into the market, do we have a strong and efficient demand to ensure that it gives us a value? Because that's, it's the maintenance of value that helps you service any debt that you may be having. So you find that our main challenge is that you'd have policies at times that do not necessarily talk to the produce, meaning that you probably have produce, but you're in an environment where your market price is actually falling. And therefore, with prices falling, you're unable to service the, the debt. But it's a combination of everything, is that you cannot look at only increasing production while not necessarily looking at what the demand looks like and what kind of market you're in. Because at the end of the day, it's the value that we have of the produce that is going to help us service the loans, if we are talking of loans, or even drive the growth and development. But in, in arriving at that, we've got to ensure that we actually build and grow our consumption. Mm -hmm. You'd argue that the African continent currently, taking South Africa out, our consumption is still very low, and a lot of it based on the consumption of primary produce with limited agro-processing. Agro the moment you move in and you have agro-processing, it multiplies the size of the sector and ultimately increases your consumption and therefore literally lifts the level, your minimum floor in terms of valuation or the value of the produce that you have. And that makes it more attractive to get involved into agriculture. And that is sort of the bridge that we need to jump. It's more of looking back into Europe and say, we need to get into a phase of industrialization. I would argue we're not yet there from an agricultural perspective. Mm -hmm. From uh, th that one bridge that you've got, to, you've got to jump over, what about a distinction needing to be made between financing of bigger projects and then debt financing for your smaller projects? To what extent is that a consideration? Well, you would argue that it is a consideration, but ultimately to get agricultural development, we're going to have to look at a combination of both. We cannot say that we're only going to look at your big, large-scale investments. You need a combination of your large-scale investments together with your small-scale investments. Because in some of the countries, you'll find that due to land tenure, land ownership is really small. Mm -hmm. it's, at, it's one acre, two acres, and you're not going to get massive sizes of 4,000, 5,000 hectares. Like that you can experience in some countries, for example, like Mozambique, you can get that in Tanzania. But if you pick a country like Uganda, you won't get access to such pieces of land. But you need to ensure that you're able to create an environment that is supportive to everyone involved within agriculture. Yeah. So it's one of trying to create a combination that is ideal for the selected country. And even if you look at it in terms of being the very small farmers, the one acre farmers, you need to build scale again to try and get them to take advantage of the benefits of economies of scale. That's linking them into some value chain. Of course, uh, we've had some uh, out there saying that uh, the uh, situation or the context is improving because there's more specialized businesses that financiers can actually get their hands on, you know. Uh, and if you have got a company like Syngenta, for example, investing, as you said, over $500 million in Africa to open up the seed technology market on the one hand to farmers to enable them to achieve greater crop yields, uh, to help them, you know, achieve economies of scale as well, surely that makes financing a little bit more tenable. Definitely. It Alicia. Our strategy is quite simple. It's, it's about helping African farmers. It's about increasing sustainably their productivity by 50% mm -hmm. to make them sustainable in terms of food production. And the way to do it is through our seed technology, our crop protection te technology, as well as our uh, seed care technology. And by doing that, we will then also transfer the knowledge and the expertise in terms of farming practices and that makes it essential to make them sustainable but also to make sure that they don't only provide for themselves but we can turn Africa into a major food exporter. Well let's hit pause on the conversation for now we're heading into a quick commercial break more on Invest Africa when we get back stay tuned. <laughs> 